If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to join me in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, just a couple of verses there, very uh, familiar verses. But before we read those verses together, I want to share with you a story. And uh, maybe it won't seem like it ties in, but just hang in there and, and, and hear the whole story and its details. And later on, it will tie in. This is a true story. It's not made up in any way, shape, or form. This is 100% accurate to history. Uh, it was October 26, 1914. None of us were alive then, right? Uh, the, the World War I was just getting rolling, um, and the British explorer Ernest Shackleton uh, set sail from Argentina with a crew of 27 men. Um, and, and what was to be the first expedition to cross the Antarctic on foot. The North Pole had been reached in 1909, because you guys all care about that, and the Norwegian Ro uh, Roald Amundsen had achieved the southernmost point of the globe in 1911, but no one had gone across the Antarctic on foot uh, in any way, shape, or form. So this was the last of the great polar expeditions, so they thought. This would be the one. And so uh, when they took off, they were expecting to come back uh, and be heralded as, as heroes and, and great explorers and all of this sort of thing. They were hoping to uh, discover some new things for science on their trip um, and, and hoping to have just a, a great time. Matter of fact, they funded their entire trip uh, before they ever left uh, by, by people investing in the book that would be written about their expedition. People bought the book that hadn't even been written yet, and, and they had a two-year uh, amount of uh, seminars planned and already booked to talk about their expedition when they returned. And so they had dreams of glory uh, and, and having uh, great fame, assuming that they would succeed in this mission. The name of their ship was Endurance, and it proves to be more prophetic than they knew because Ernest Shackleton and his men would not return home, are you ready for this, for 17 months. 17 months, and under very different circumstances than what they had hoped or imagined. Uh, their ship, the, the Endurance, never even reached Antarctica, uh, but instead became stuck 60 miles off the coast while attempting to make its way through a sea of pack ice. And from that point on, they were stranded. All they could do was wait through the bitter Antarctic winter, looking forward to the spring when the ice would melt and they could sail free. But that day never came. Instead, after being trapped in the ice for nine months, they were finally forced to abandon their ship as the pressure of the tons of ice pushing against its wooden sides finally began to crush it into pieces. And when that happened, uh, their mission changed. No longer were they concerned with crossing the Antarctic. Their only goal was to be rescued and to return home safely. And conditions looked very bleak. They were still stranded on a massive ice floe, except that now they had no ship, but only three lifeboats. And again, they could only wait and watch for another six months as the ocean currents carried them along. Finally, the ice cleared enough to allow them to launch the lifeboats and set out for the nearest land, which was about 80 miles away. And after several days of rowing, they made it to a small, uninhabited island. Sounds great, right? Now they're good to go. No. Although they were now safe from the perils of, of the ocean and the ice, they still had no hope of being rescued. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, their ship had been lost at sea. Uh, no one knew where they were or even that they were alive, uh, so they had, and they had no radio, no way of contacting a rescue party, and somehow they had to make it to civilization. So Shackleton and, his few, and a few of the men set off again in their lifeboats heading for South Georgia Island where uh, there was a whaling station. Now, amazingly, they were able to cross 870 miles of open ocean in a rowboat. Let that sink in for a second. 870 miles of open ocean in a rowboat. And they reached their destination. But even then, they were not finished. The only human settlement was on the opposite side of the island, and the terrain was so treacherous and so icy and mountainous that and, and no one had ever successfully traveled across the island. And so they did all of this um, with... They had been exhausted from 522 days of surviving in the ice and in the sea, and somehow they managed with no climbing gear and no, uh, no modern uh, amenities or anything of that nature to march and to climb and to scale their, scale their way to the other side. And from there, a rescue party was sent out to retrieve the others that were left behind. It's difficult for me to imagine what these men went through 
and what they endured over those 17 months. Can you imagine 17 months of every morning waking up to freezing temperatures? Uh, you only had a, maybe a change of clothes and, and you had to hunt seals for your food and no hope of survival by any human standards. It just seemed hopeless. Hebrews chapter 12, we read uh, a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's talked about many times in the church, and I don't want to diminish it by any means. Let's look at the first two verses, because there is great value in these verses for our lives as we move forward in relationship with Christ. So Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 2, we read, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, I come to you and I just ask that you would open your word to us, that we would hear your truth, your Holy Spirit, God, that you would speak to every man, woman, and child in this place God, if there's any distractions that lay in our path that, that stop us from turning our attention to you, God, help us to lay that aside, whether it's work or family issues or things going on uh, with our neighbors or whatever it may be. God, help us to just turn our attention to you and your holy word and your Holy Spirit living in us that we would hear from you and know your truth. Father, I, I, th I just thank you for uh, this day that we can come and worship you with like-minded believers. And I thank you that we have this opportunity before us today. So we pray that you would just once again speak to your people. And so, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. Amen. This passage of Scripture comes right on the heels of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Obviously, that makes sense as we read numerically through the chapters of Hebrews. But chapter 11 is known in the Bible as the faith chapter. It starts off with a, a brief definition of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not yet seen. And then it continues on throughout the book of Hebrews chapter 11 to explain People who have walked in faith. And it starts off with Abraham and giving us a, a lot of details about Abraham. It continues on down through some people that you might have heard of, some of them you might not have heard of from the Old Testament and from Hebrew history. And it gives us some details of their faith in God and what God did through their faith and how he, he moved in people's lives and how he changed the world forever through those people. It continues on uh, even into unknown people that it doesn't tell us the names it just says many were, and it gives the examples of what they paid as a price for their faith in God. And then we start off Hebrews chapter 12 with that word, therefore, which I've always uh, heard is whenever you hear the word, therefore, you're supposed to stop and see what it's there for because it's a transitional word. And so it is that hinge point from Hebrews chapter 11, talking about faith into how that applies to your life and my life today. And that is the most important piece of this whole thing. It's one thing to read Hebrews 11 and say, wow, these people were awesome. They had great faith in God. They did amazing things, and some of them suffered immensely, but these are awesome people. That's great. But how does that impact your life? And so in Hebrews chapter 12, we have that hinge word, and now we have God's instruction for your life and for my life. And so it starts off saying we have this great crowd of witnesses referring to all of those individuals who have gone on before us and who are in heaven looking down at the world and saying, keep going and keep keep." working towards your, your relationship with God and keeps uh, striving in this world that doesn't get it. And then it continues and it says also for le to let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. I want to just break down this passage of Scripture for a minute because there are some truths in this passage of Scripture that we need to own as people of God. If we are in right relationship with God, we should, we should gather truth from His Word. We should be applying it to our life. And this is a very applicable passage of Scripture. There are so many pieces therein that are meant and intended for us to apply. There are certain passages of Scripture which are narrative. They tell a story, and this is not one of them. This is an instructive passage of Scripture giving us God's plan for our life. It almost seems ambiguous in some way, but let's unpackage it just for a moment. And so I just want to point out a, a couple of truths that I have found in this passage of Scripture. The first is this. Satan is really good at making us lose focus. Uh, that's the absolute truth in life. 
Satan is really, really good at making us lose focus. I look back at this story of when Jesus is, is teaching his disciples and he has walked with his disciples for a time and he has taught in, in front of them. He has, he has healed people. He has performed miracles and he's done many great things. And the disciples have been right there and they have seen this happen. And then there is this moment where there's a large crowd and he's taught them and, and he has broken bread and fish only a few loaves and a couple of fish, and he has fed 5,000. You remember the story, right? And, and as Jesus has done this thing, uh, this miracle that doesn't make any sense, and then the disciples gather up 12 baskets of leftover food, then he tells his disciples to get in a boat and go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he would go off and pray with the intentions of meeting them later. I find it interesting in that passage of Scripture that none of the disciples, or it's not recorded anyhow, that any of the disciples ask Jesus what his plan is. Okay, so you're going to meet us, the fishermen, the sailors in the group, on the other side. How are you getting there? They never seem to ask that question of Jesus. And so they start sailing, and Jesus goes up on the mountainside, and he starts praying. And then it tells us at the third watch of the night, or about 3 a.m., they are in the middle of a massive storm. And everything around them is, is, is taking place and they're, they're going nowhere. And then Jesus starts walking on the water coming across to them. We know the story, right? And as that happens, they become afraid because, let's face it, no one has seen anyone walk on water. And, and so they, they start to try to figure out if he's a ghost or if they're just delusional or whatever it may be. And Jesus speaks to them. And Peter, he says, well, if it's really you, Jesus, then you need to tell me to come walk on the water. And Jesus, of course, says, Come on, Peter. And so Peter gets out of the boat and starts to walk towards Jesus, right? We remember the story. But here's where Satan starts to play his part. As Peter is walking towards Jesus, and he is walking on water, his faith in Christ and the power of Christ in front of him is accomplishing something that is impossible to the world. And as that is going on, then Peter becomes distracted. And he sees the wind and the waves around him. And when he starts to be distracted by the other things happening, then he loses focus on who Christ is and what Christ is doing. Satan is really good at distracting us or making us lose our focus. That's just one illustration from, from the situation with Peter. Let's give another. Later on, Peter is, is walking with Jesus on the way to Jerusalem where Jesus is about to be arrested and crucified and dead and buried and overcome sin and death in the grave and raise again. We know that part of the story because it's history. It's in our past and we can look back on it. Peter did not yet know the full story, although Jesus had told him. And on the way, Jesus, or Peter in one moment declares that Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah that you are the one who will save all of Israel. And in the very next moment, we see the words where Peter interrupts Jesus and says, no, that's not the plan. You can't do this thing. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but rather your own plan or your own agenda. See, Satan is really good at making us lose focus and to take our eyes off of what is important. This passage of Scripture, as we read it, tells us that there are things that, that, that encumber us. There are things that weigh us down, and they get in the way. And so many times they come in subtly, and it doesn't seem like a big deal because Satan's really good at making us lose our focus. If, if Satan were to come along and just give us something blatant and say, you need to reject God and serve me, we would probably say, you know what, Satan, you're kind of crazy. But that's not how he operates. He is the, he is the father of light. He is the, the, the one of lies. He comes in and he disguises things. And so Satan, he subtly distracts us or makes us lose our focus. And it comes in small ways of temptation and things of that nature. And so slowly our focus turns off of Christ and who he is and what he's doing, and it turns on to self. And so Satan is really good at making us lose our focus. This passage of Scripture, let me read the beginning part one more time. Therefore, since we have so great a crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is marked out for us. There is this portion in that scripture, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which easily entangles us. That, 
that line right there, that phrase, just kind of indicates to us just how easy it is for Satan to make us lose our focus. We can run the race focused on Christ who has already run the race and knows what he's doing and knows how to get us through the race, but instead, so many times we, we lose that focus because Satan ensnares us. Satan entangles us. He weighs us down so many times. What weighs you down or entangles you? What keeps you from going forward? When I was in high school, many of you already know this. I've, I've shared this before. I was a runner. I ran track. I ran cross country. And I felt like I was pretty good at it. I did, did all right. I got medals. I won a lot of races. There is one race in particular that stands out in my mind, though. It was my senior year. And uh, I was... I had a goal to break the, the mile record at the school. I'd already broken it once, but I wanted to really put it in the ground so that no one could ever touch it again. And, and I was really feeling it that day. I had four races that day, just like every crash, uh, track meet. And I, and I had ran the first one, and, I, and I'd come into the second event and, and done okay. And now I'm ready for that mile race, and I was geared up to break the school record. Okay, And I started running, and I was doing my best, and I was, I was hearing people in the crowd cheering for me, my family, friends, things of that nature. I was really doing well. I was in first place, and I was in first place by a long, long way. And I had about one lap left in the race, and my coach, who was on the field, yelled to me, slow down, Stephen, you have other races to run today. And knowing I had such a huge lead, I allowed that to make me lose my focus, and I did. I slowed down a little bit. And when I crossed the finish line, I was one second away from breaking the record. So many times we allow subtle little things to allow us to lose focus. And, and, and we... We lose sight of what God is planning for our lives. We lose sight of what God is doing. And before we know it, we are so weighed down that we don't know how to free us. Sin has that sticky, weird way of doing that in our lives. Let me give you a story from the Old Testament that, that maybe you've heard this story before, but I want to shed some light on it for just a moment. There is this, this story in the book of Judges. It's about a man by the name of Samson. He has uh, committed his life to serve God, and he has taken a vow, specifically the Nazarite vow, which uh, would not allow him to cut his hair um, because he was uh, committing that part of his life as a covenant relationship between him and God to serve God faithfully. And, and Samson, there's other parts of the Nazarite vow, don't get me wrong, but Samson, he starts to dabble with other things, and it starts off slowly. We see it in Samson's life at the very beginning of the story of Samson. He is doing great things for God. And the people of Israel are finding him as a champion and as someone who's pointing them back towards God. And then he gets snared up by that thing that snares so many men. And it is this, it was a woman. And he starts to look at other women. He marries someone he should not have married according to Hebrew law. And that marriage ends badly. And then he gets involved with another individual by the name of Delilah. We all know the story, right? And what's interesting to me in that whole story of Samson and Delilah is this. It starts off very, very casual. Nothing wrong here. He's just hanging out with her, getting to know her, having a good time. And then the Philistine army would approach and Samson and his great strength his supernatural power would go out and he would defeat the Philistine army or the men that were in front of him. And then he would come back to Delilah and he would lay down on the couch, put his head in her lap, and she would stroke his hair as they watched Netflix and all of this stuff. And then the Philistine army would approach again and he would go out and he'd be victorious. And over time, Delilah says to him one day, Samson, I don't understand how you have all of this strength. It doesn't make any sense to me. No other man has this. What is, what is the, the secret? And so he tells her a story. It's not the real secret. He tells her a story, and then he falls asleep to take a nap. And while he's fall, fallen asleep and taking this nap, she does the thing that he had told her would thwart his strength. And then she yells out, hey, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he, st he gets up from his nap, and he, sure enough, she had done the thing that he had told her would, would make him weak, but he had told her the wrong thing, and so he was just as strong as normal. He goes out and he defeats the Philistines. We know the story, right? This happens a couple of times. Now, if it were me, I would think that 
you need to quit telling this woman what's your weakness uh, or pretended weakness because every time you tell her the thing, she tries to do it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in the story. I'm sitting there going, Samson, how, how thick are you? But here's the thing. I'm not in that situation. And if I were in that situation, I have a feeling that Samson, if he were asked the question at the very beginning of knowing Delilah, he would have been like, you're crazy, woman. I'm not going to tell you anything. Maybe he would have been a little more respectful than that. I don't know. Maybe not. But the point is, he developed a relationship with her. And Satan, he's really good at distracting us, making us lose focus. And Samson, slowly over that time, his desire to serve God and to lead Israel changes into a desire to please Delilah, to make her happy. And so he has slowly, over time, let down his guard from that which God had intended for him. Satan is really good at making us lose our focus. And what happened is, we know the story, finally, after much nagging, it tells us in the Bible, he finally relents to her because he was, uh, he was annoyed to the point of death, it tells us, which I'm sitting there going, that's a healthy relationship, right? Him and Delilah, healthy relationship. He's annoyed to the point of death, and so he finally tells her the true story, and of course, just like all of the other situations, she does the thing. She cuts his hair. And he goes out, and here's the verse that scares me so much. It is one of, the, the, one of the scariest verses in the entire Bible. When she wakes him up after cutting his hair, we're told this. Samson goes out to face the Philistines just as before because he did not realize that the Spirit of God had left him. It's an important verse. He had slowly compromised. He had slowly taken his eyes off of what he should have been looking at, God's purpose for his life and God's relationship with him. He had slowly allowed Satan to let him lose his focus, and he didn't even realize where he was at anymore. He thought he was great. He thought he was serving God the same as he had at the beginning, but rather he was serving Delilah, or maybe more bluntly, he was serving his own lusts and his own purposes. Satan's really good at making us lose focus. And the interesting thing about it, in my life anyhow, is it doesn't ever seem like Satan throws this pack on my back of, of huge weight that weighs me down all at once. But rather, he, he adds a little bit at a time. And before it's all said and done, there is so little that I can actually do because I have strayed away from that relationship. It's not that God has ever left me. It's that I have slowly turned my eyes away from him. And what I find is that I become entangled, snared, because Satan, he's really good. If I had been running that race in high school and listening to the people in the crowd telling me to run harder, faster, I probably would have broken the school record that day. And I'm not throwing the coach completely under the bus, although a little. But sometimes we need to put our eyes, our attention, solely on God. No, not sometimes. We need to do that all the time. So many times we find that we can maybe look away for a moment. Or we can turn our attention towards our own needs. Our own career, our own friendships, our own family situations, and whatever those things are. And they're not bad. It's not bad to have a great career and to work towards that. It's not bad to have a great family relationship and to work towards that. It's not bad to you know fill in the blank with whatever the things are. But if they start to take the place of our relationship with God, if they start to distract us or make us lose our focus, then they become idols to us. So let me ask this question one more time. What weighs you down? What entangles you and keeps you from going forward? Because here's the simple truth. That's exactly what sin does. Now, I didn't ask this person to do this beforehand, but I'm going to do something that I love to do is put somebody on the spot. And we don't have a large crowd, so how many of you are feeling nervous at the moment? Titus, can you come up here for a second, please? Come on. You won't have to say anything, I promise. So Titus is my son, so I can pick on him a little bit. And as you can tell, Titus is really big and buff, just like his daddy, right? It's okay. Titus, can you do me a favor? Since you already have your shoes off, part of why I picked you, can you slip into those for a minute? Just go ahead and stand in those. And, and go ahead and take your hands out of your pockets. You might need them for balance a little bit. 
here's the thing. I, I made these shoes up a long time ago. They are, there's 50 pounds of concrete represented here, 25 pounds apiece. And Titus ran cross-country. He he's, has some athleticism himself, and so he, he should be able to do just fine. And, and matter of fact, Titus, can you walk from there over to there while wearing those shoes? You can hear just how hollow our stage is. Thank you, Titus. Just stand right there. Titus can still function with these on his feet. Now, I think all of us can see that it's awkward and that it's not a comfortable function. But here's how Satan so easily distracts us. Here's how Satan gets our focus off of him as he slowly starts to add weight to us. He ensnares us. And we think we're okay because we can still walk in the right direction, or so we perceive. But I'm willing to bet that Titus would not win a race against any of us in this room wearing those. I'm willing to bet that Titus can't do any jumping jacks wearing those. Do you want to try? I'm willing to bet that Titus can't jump very high while wearing those, or run even kind of fast wearing those. Does it weigh you down? You don't have to say anything, you just nod. Thank you, Titus. You can go ahead and sit down. Thanks. Appreciate it. Just leave them right there. <laughs> leave them right there. Satan does that in our lives. He adds things that slowly entangle us. Now, now the illustration doesn't fully fit because Titus slipped into weight all of a sudden, but this is what God does, or Satan does in our lives, is he puts weight and he slows us down and he, he slowly distracts us by saying, you know what? I need you to focus in on, on, on achieving this goal, or I need you to, I need you to, to do this thing, or this is really fun. You should try it out. And, and in so many ways, we allow those things, just like Samson, to come in and distract us and help us to lose our focus, even though that's never our goal. It's never our intention, but that's so many times what Satan does because he is really good at it. He is really, really good at making us lose our focus. But understand this next truth from this scripture that is super important to us. God has a greater plan. His plan is perfect. His plan is complete. And understand this, God has a greater plan and it is a plan to perfect your faith. Now that almost seems like a goal that we can never achieve. And you're right. In and of yourself, you will never achieve that goal. But it is the goal and it is the plan of God to do that very thing, to perfect your faith. Let's read it in the scripture here for just a moment. Therefore, since we have uh, so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and what? Perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That doesn't even make sense. The cross, joy, that's not joyous. Matter of fact, on the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? And it was not joyous, but the result was joyous, which was freedom from sin, which was forgiveness and guilt taken away from us. For the joy set before him, and he endured the cross, and he despised its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, God has a greater plan for you than for you to be ensnared and entangled in sin. He has a greater plan for each and every one of us, and it may seem like you cannot do it, and I want to encourage you, you can't, but God can. God absolutely can. Let me challenge you with this question. When in the Bible, or even in church history, does God call someone to do something that they already can do on their own? Take a look at it. Throughout Scripture, we so many times put value in what we can accomplish, but more, more times than any other, God chooses to ask people and call people to do something they cannot do on their own. He takes stuttering Moses, a murderer, and sends him back to the land where he's wanted as a murderer and makes him a public speaker. Right. Or, or let's try something more challenging. I already showed you that he made Peter, who is a man and cannot do this, walk on water. And even as Peter has denied him three times and has called, or Jesus has, himself has called him Satan, later on he says to Peter, you are the rock on which I am building my church. Or there are so many other times where God calls people to do something they cannot do on their own. Matter of fact, I would argue that you cannot find a spot in the Bible where God does not do that. He chooses Gideon while he's hiding in a wine press to lead a vast army. 
and then he windles that army down to nothing and gives him an awesome victory that he could have never won on his own. Just one example after the next of how God does amazing things. Why? Because he has a greater plan for you, a plan to perfect your faith. Let me put it to you this way. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says it this way in verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, this is Paul. Paul is talking about this thorn in his flesh that he has tried to get rid of on his own and this thorn that has has messed him up so many times. And so he has cried out to God, you need to do something about this. Are you ready for it? In verse 9 and 10, Jesus' response, it's in red letters in your Bible, says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect when you are weak. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness or in insults, in hardships or persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, that's when God is strong. Or Paul writes later on to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24, just showing us that this is his plan, not our plan. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify or set you apart through and through every bit of your being. And may your whole spirit, your soul, your body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that in and of itself is like, man, he's still asking us to do something we cannot do. He is, because this next line comes in there. The one who called you, Christ Jesus, is faithful and he will do the work in you. See the difference in this illustration. I, I obviously did not intend for Titus to wear these forever. Because sin has a different approach than these. In these, I can take my foot, because of the way I built them, and I can slide it in there. And just as easily, I can take them back off. Sin's not so easy to drop. Because sin ensnares us. It entangles us. It would have been more accurate if I had had forms up here and poured wet concrete into it and then stuck Titus's feet in there with no shoes in them. And then let it dry and then tell him to walk and run. And oh, by the way, now you can't get it off. Because in and of himself, he couldn't. It would have taken me with a hammer and chisel and much time and much work to have removed concrete from him. In the same way, God intends a perfect plan for you. He wants us to be able to put off that sin that so easily entangles us and ensnares us. He wants us to throw it off. Why? Because he has done the work. He has already taken the hammer and the chisel and he has chiseled away sin. He has defeated it. It is not yours to hang on to any longer. It is the power and the grace of God that can overcome it. So that leads me to the third point in this passage of Scripture that I want to share with you. And that is this truth. Achieving the goal does not come easy. It does not come easy. And I'm not trying to say here that we need to earn the forgiveness of sins. That will never happen. Because while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ died for us. It is by grace that we are saved, not of works that anyone would boast, but it is the grace of God that saves us. So hear me, I'm not saying that this is accomplished when we work harder or when we do more good. But understand, achieving the goal of being close to God and and having victory over sin does not come easy. Matter of fact, this passage of Scripture told us that it took Christ to the cross. That's not an easy thing to have asked of any person, save the Son of God. And he did it willingly. It, It took him to a grave. And 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 in that grave, in those three days, he descended into hell and he defeated Satan. Something you and I never, ever, ever can do on our own. It was not easy in any way, shape, or form. And just the same, he has called us to fix our eyes on him so that we can run the perfect race. Now understand that no matter how long or how short the race is, it requires effort. It requires endurance. The story we read at the beginning of these gentlemen who started off to try to traverse the Antarctic, they had to exhibit immense endurance to accomplish a goal that they had started out for. Matter of fact, they named their ship after it, Endurance. But then when all tragedy hit them, they found that they needed even greater endurance just to survive and to make it home. In our relationship with God, we need to understand that achieving the goal of overcoming sin in our life, it's not cheap. It's not to be lightly taken. It costs Christ his life. And not only that, but it needs us to walk in spiritual discipline. 
that we would read the word of God so we would know his plan, his path, that we would surrender to self daily. That's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He said to his disciples, if anyone would follow me, he must daily deny self, cast off sin, get rid of the concrete, and take up his cross, the hard, enduring part of life, and follow. So there is truth in this passage of Scripture that we need to see. And that is this truth. There is no way. There is no way to overcome sin other than to fix our eyes on Christ. There is no way to have victory over those things than to put our eyes on Him and to throw off that which so easily entangles and ensnares us. So let me ask that question a third time. What weighs you down? What entangles you? keeps you from going forward? Is it a person? Is it an attitude? Is it an addiction? Is it just giving in to your own desires and your own plan rather than understanding that God has a greater plan? His plan is to perfect us. His plan is to give us victory over sin in our lives. Because the Word tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, that there is no temptation. No temptation that has taken you but what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with every temptation he has made a way of escaping it. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up here this morning. I don't normally end a service this way, but we're going to just have a, a pause for reflection. They've got a song that they're going to share with us. And I want you to consider this truth. God has a plan for your life. And that plan is to co overcome sin in your life. The sin of greed, the sin of lust, the sin of whatever addiction it may be, the sin of, of just ignoring God and His plan and His perfect place for you. And God wants to do the work of perfecting you. It's slow. It takes endurance. It takes the grace of God day in and day out to achieve. Sorry, Alicia. But God does do the work. He has a plan. So they're going to share with us. And while they share this song, let's look at our own hearts. Let's look at our own lives and ask ourselves this question the fourth time. What thing is ensnaring us? What thing is entangling us? And guess what? God can break that. He can change that. And so respond to him this day. You can come forward if you want to to pray to surrender that thing to God and ask him to break it and to change you and to, to give you that path once again to unentangle you, you can do it right where you're sitting, whichever you're comfortable with. But make that commitment to God today.